Hi, good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Sabir, and I direct events here at the Strand. We are so happy to have everyone here tonight. Before we launch into a discussion of Taffy's novel, Fleischmann is in Trouble, I'd like to share a little bit of history about the Strand. The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass over on Fourth Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled until after 93 years, the Strand is the sole survivor, still run by the Bass family, now with third generation owner, Nancy Bass Wyden. We want to thank all of you for your support. Without our loyal community of book lovers, authors like Taffy and Meg, we wouldn't be here today. Yeah. Tonight, we are excited to have with us Taffy Rodessa Ackner for the paperback release of her novel, Fleischman is in Trouble. Taffy is a staff writer at the New York Times Magazine. Prior to that, her work appeared in GQ, ESPN the Magazine, Matter, Details, Texas Monthly, Outside, Self, Cosmopolitan, and many other publications. Fleischman is in Trouble is her first novel. Joining Taffy in conversation is Meg Wolitzer. Meg is the New York Times bestselling author of The Female Persuasion, The Interestings, The Uncoupling, The Tenure Nap, The Position, The Wife, and Sleepwalking. She's also the author of the young adult novel, Belzar. Wolitzer lives in New York City. And so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Kathy and Meg. Well, hi everybody. Thank I'm you here. so happy to be here. Uh, Taffy, congratulations, this is so exciting. Thank you, and not, and not the least of which is you hosting this tonight. So thank you so much for doing this, Meg. My pleasure. So I've been wondering what it is like having your paperback come out in the middle of a pandemic. And I wondered <laughs> if maybe you and Random House thought about changing the title to this is how long the virus lasts on different surfaces. Maybe that would bring a lot of people in to read it. Maybe, maybe I could have <laughs> I, that know, know. Like, I have the cure. Fleischmann has the cure. Yes, right. Fleischmann no. is vaccine, vaccine making. Right. I mean, I love this novel and oh, I am you. really, really happy to be here doing this with you, even virtually. It's a very exciting book and it's about a lot of things. And looking at reviews, I agree with what your flap copy and the reviews say it's about, which is marriage, divorce, sex, who gets to tell the story, who's the one who's perennially listening. And Elizabeth Gilbert had uh, something interesting to say about the book. She said, it's just the sort of thing that Philip Roth or John Updike might have produced in their prime, except of course, that the author understands women. And I wondered, what do you think of that? Um, what was your relationship to those writers when you were younger? And I'm not saying your relationship as in you personally wrote Asymmetry, um, <laughs> but were, were either of those writers uh, important to you, Updike, Roth, and, and how? Updike was not, but Philip Roth was. And when I was, when I was a, a young adult, um, I was in a very religious household and my mother would not let me read young adult fiction because she, like I kept trying to sneak Sweet Valley High books. Oh yeah. And my mother just thought those those girls looked like such trouble and I wasn't allowed to read them. My my older sister though, I'm about 12 right at this age. My older sister had Philip Roth books which had a text only cover. So I wasn't allowed to read a Sweet Valley High book, but my sister was at the dining room table reading Portnoy's Complaint and yeah. because it looked like literature. And so I just took those books from her. And I think that they, I wonder how much of those comparisons come from the fact that those were my first very profound adult reading experiences. They happened way before I was an adult, but they kind of set me on fire with like, the energy around them. I didn't recognize misogyny. I didn't recognize anything problematic, but like another Jewish person telling a very urgent, um, kind of angry, kind of, I can't believe this happened to me story. And I loved them. And I read Portnoy's Complaint and I read Goodbye Columbus. And then I, as you know, he was still writing a lot then, and I would read the book a year that he had that came out, and I would read the back catalog. I haven't read all of it, but like, and I do have questions about why I would read things like My Life as a Man and not have concerns about the treatment of women, but the, it always seemed to me that his issues weren't with women, but with 
the objects of his sexual desire, like the specific objects of his special sexual desire. I don't know. I don't think I think that anymore. But don't you think though that maybe? I mean, thinking of my own experiences reading books with like sexual material, it felt so sophisticated and it felt very bold. So that misogyny, I, I wouldn't even notice it until I got to a certain age. I just felt excited sort of being allowed in the room in a way. Exactly. I felt the same exact way. And I felt like I was being told a secret and I was being told how it was. And I do wonder how that informed me. But yeah, I felt the same way. It was so exciting. But the minute that you actually do realize, oh, this is misogynist, it's like you can never unsee it. Right. 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 Or you go through the reading period first where you're like, wait, uh oh, is everyone right about this? Oh no. No, it's very disappointing because some of it's so exciting. So you want them to oh. be right and to be good. Yeah. So when you were writing your first novel, this novel, what? um, did you like did you think about people saying I mean not that you were gaming the system, I don't I don't mean that, but did you think, oh, people will say this is rough? Like, did you have an energy in there when you were writing that was somehow almost channeling that? I mean, I did not think of that. I just thought that, I thought it sounded more like my magazine work and no one's ever said that about my magazine work. So I, I don't know, I, I, it was, I think that what's always shocking to me is the need for comparison um, because everyone like Elizabeth Gilbert who is wonderful and a fairy godmother here, who gave a blurb like that to a book, um, it was it was shocking to me, but they know what they're doing. Like this is how the book business goes. But you also see it in magazines that like, the minute that people like something, they have to compare it to the closest thing. And I do wonder how much, not from her, she's a very sophisticated reader, but the people who, compare every profile that they like of mine to something that Gay Talese would have done. If you read Gay Talese, it's not at all, like that's just what they think of when they think of a profile. I think it's a way to give a compliment. I don't necessarily know if there's that much overlap because surely my Bradley Cooper profile is not like Frank Sinatra has a cold in that I had hours with Bradley Cooper. Like, it's a completely different thing. So I don't know how much comparison is just something we need to do. Or I wonder if it's like something about it being Jewy. Like uh, this, the like you do it in your books too. The art of being Jewy, which is also known as Jewish, without <laughs> without being um b without it being about religion, right? But isn't there also a third aspect that I don't want to lose that thread about Jewishness, but isn't there another aspect, which is that in both cases, like the gay to lease profiles and the height of Esquire in the 60s, say, and 70s and fiction um, in the 60s and 70s, we consider that a golden age right. for fiction and also for magazine journalism. Right. I mean, yeah. think yeah. of mag this is the era of magazine journalism. Um, so you're being I mean, I still work at one, so <laughs> I disagree. Okay. <laughs> but it's certainly not like the ascendant voicey men's magazine story is no longer ascendant. But you 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 put your I guess sensibility in everything. And I think that there's a commonality between your your uh, journalism and your fiction. I mean, there's this great essay by Zadie Smith and she talks about writing novels and she says, when I write, I'm trying to express my way of being in the world. Do you think that in a way your I well, I think I can answer that for you. I feel like your writing is doing that. Can you speak to that? I, that's such an interest. I, I didn't read that essay and I should, um, but yeah, I think, I think I'm always just trying to be heard and I'm always, I have been trying to be heard for so long and my career didn't take off till I was in my thirties. And that's a long time to wait for people to listen to you. Yeah, you actually have a line in the book um, which goes, whatever kind of woman you are, even when you're a lot of kinds of women, you're still always just a woman, which is to say you're always a little bit less than a man. Yeah. Do you think, how much, how gendered? was this not being heard, do you think? It was so gendered. Like it was so 
even when I finally was sent on magazine stories, they were to the kinds that you would send a woman to, right? If you, at, when I was at GQ. Um, I think that we instill, we instill male thought and male discourse with a kind of importance. We do? Don't include me in that. No, I'm saying the we, I don't. I mean, or maybe I do, maybe I'm the producer of it as someone who writes about men. But I've been very, I, this is what I'll say about it. I have been, I am, I have access to the vol, the, the metrics of the stories I do. And it appears to me that when I write about a woman, women read it. And when I write about a man, everyone reads it. Yeah. So what does that say? What does that mean? Well, wasn't there that study? Again, I don't, I don't want to call it a study. It might've been five people. I don't really know how big it was, but I read something anecdotally that uh, above and beyond looking at like the Vita numbers where they do the pie chart of how many women are being published in literary publications and also by, you know, right. how many women are being published by publishers. They, somebody looked at how many books had won prizes that were not only that were not by women, but that were from a female point of view. Right. It was it shrank down? It shrank down to really low. The notion that the male voice is the every voice in a way. Um, you have another line in the book. Um, Libby speaks of her own writing and says, and I thought this was really, really interesting. Uh, my empathy only created more empathy, which sounds good, yes, but was born of inherent cowardice. I was too scared to finish with anger, though I knew well how anger can incite the gut and leave the best kind of scars. Right. What are the best kind of scars? What is that? What is that? that? That That's how I felt when I was reading Philip Roth, like scarred by it. Um, and I felt when I was writing, like early on in my magazine career, I felt that the the empathy that I used was a cop out for being as angry as I am because I felt that that the the places I was writing would not brook anger from a woman, um, and 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 that's terrible. I was it's you know it's so funny. It's reminding me. I was recently asked to participate in some weird online essay off between me and some guy who says the novel is dead. And I like looked into him and he wrote this thing about how a great novel has not been published since the corrections. And I was like, I don't know it like, and I, and I declined. And I, when I declined, I said to them, you should, you should be aware of what you're asking me to do. You're not asking me to defend the novel. You're asking me to defend women's, uh, women's domination of the novel. Um, which is which means you're asking me to defend a woman's a woman's right to speak authoritatively about the American experience. Yeah. If you go back to Philip Roth, the thing that I didn't realize he was doing then, I would only realize after I read so much more, was that there were so few people who were taking the American Jewish experience seriously. And he he was doing it in an entertaining way where the Jewishness was a part of his life without being something he wrestled with. And that, that was what set me on fire. And his anger at the fact that he, he didn't want to be a Jew the way his parents were Jews stayed with me. And as a woman in the world, I wasn't able to pull off that kind of searing debate and searing anger but I could do it in the um, I could do it in a more subtle way um, in my writing as a character, even if the character the character is me as a nonfiction narrator. What you're saying in a way is that you admire nerve. Yeah, I do too. What is it? I mean, first of all, I have to say I like a woman who uses the word "brook" as a verb. Um, we did a moment ago. Um, what? Uh, like, I, I feel like with nerve, you feel there is a sense of not being afraid of what people will think of you, right. the voice behind the fiction, right? I mean, yeah. is that something, well, you've been very public. I, I want to talk a little bit in a while, but I, I want to stay on the novel, but I do want to talk about your your interviews because I know they've gotten so much attention, but do you care? How much do you care what people think of you? Like when your novel was coming out, 
did you feel uh, that that was a big thing, like what people think of you? It's like all I thought about, and I and I. So did you think about it when you were writing, or just when you were publishing? I. You know what? I've been very lucky that I feel that I can write without anybody's voice in my head. Yeah. And then when I publish it, I'm like. Holy shit! What are people? What can I do? Me? Like, is this how I want to represent myself? Is this how I want to represent my like? Who who else am I bringing down with this? What if this fails? I I think about it all the time in a way that makes it shocking that I would take any kind of risk, even writing a novel when I was already doing okay as a journalist. There, I guess there are two parts of me, and one of them has the anger and the audacity and the other one is trying to like survive as a like a forward facing woman in the world like audience facing woman <laughs> if you're gonna have those two sides it's certainly better to have them in this direction rather right, than, than in the other one where you're like, you rather look good in photos or in real life <laughs> like, we don't want to be someone who doesn't take risks in their writing and is incredibly aggressive and angry at in no, really. <laughs> what taking risks means to me, I guess, and, and in terms of this book, I mean, I, and I, I feel like we're speaking too generally, and I really want people to read your book if they haven't already. Um, this really is an exploration of contemporary life and male and female dynamics and sex and sexuality and family and the intersections of these things. And there's no sense that you stopped and thought, is this too angry? Right. Is this too serious? Is this or is this too funny? I, I didn't have that sense at all. And that I think you feel in a book like Portnoy's Complaint, in which the the humor and the pathos are just right up against each other. Right. That's so interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I, I so so Toby Fleischman is divorced and an acrimonious divorce, and his wife drops his kids off when uh, she's supposed to have them. And the book is a look back at marriage and it's about being a man in sort of very much in demand in this sort of app, right. sex app dating app culture. Um, you've been married for how many years? 14. 14 years. Do you feel like you were like studying a subculture? Because I know you said in an interview something about being fascinated by these people talking to you about their divorces. I did. I felt like I felt like it was a relatively safe, you know, you talk about taking risks. I didn't realize I was taking a risk in, in saying something perhaps about my marriage by right, by, by having a first novel be about marriage. What I thought was I was doing a really interesting story, uh, more about middle age right. and also about the way that things changed. Like, the instinct that came to me to write this was very much the same instinct I have to write a magazine story. This is different than it used to be. That is always the same. That is always the instinct. Wait, is this the same as it used to be? No, it's not. When you were, when I was, when, when you were young, when I was young in the nineties, I had to show up in my human form at a place in order to attract male attention, which now seems to me like, how dare they make me do that when I could have been doing that through a device that whole time? I could have been also watching TV. I could have been also no, I'm watching TV right now. I mean, I'm <laughs> good. Golden Girls tonight. Just crack me up. Really There's funny. a marathon, I think. <laughs> no, but you know, it's funny about the novel though, because we want things that feel permanent in some way and yet the novel is such a great vessel for examining the culture right in the moment. and this does feel very much of the moment but i don't think it will date badly i i don't um i mean i think it's about this unexamined moment where we were told as girls that we could be anything and we grew up to find out that that was true but nobody told the men like nobody told the men that we were being told this and so even the men with the most with the strongest feminist instinct the strongest move toward equality even those men were like 
shocked to find out that things would now be expected of them in a cisgender heterosexual marriage that weren't expected of their fathers. The, you know, like, uh, like they understand that, that the woman does not have to bring them a martini at the end of the day anymore. But does that mean they don't get a martini? Like, do they have to bring their wives the martini? Is there a martini anymore? I don't know. When did you think I'm a feminist? When did I think what? I'm a feminist. When was that like a conscious? In my, in my life, it was, yeah. it was, this is, I mean, this is like, we talked about not realizing misogyny in your life. I went to an all girls school. I have three sisters, no brothers. I was raised by a single mother. Like I didn't ever think anything else right. until I remember I, it was late in the game. I was, because it didn't occur to me to have questions of a dichotomy of are you or are you not? Um, again, I was being told I could do anything. In a Hasidic household, I was being told I could do anything. And I remember I was doing a profile, one of my first profiles for a women's magazine. And it was around then, 2006, that somebody, some editor said to me, ask her if, ask her if she's a feminist. And I said, why? And she said, it always gets a good answer. And I looked up the possible, like, when has that happened? And it's always this trap question that women's magazines would ask their cover stars. Are you a feminist? And half of the women didn't, were not in 2006, like politicized enough or political enough to understand what I was asking them. Like they thought, like they were, they thought I was asking if they were aggressively something. And, and I remember refusing to ask that question. It didn't make me great. I just recognized what it is. I mean, I I was told also to ask what their least favorite parts of their body was, and I had to ask that once or twice before I was like, oh, I don't think I want to be part of this. Um, but I think I didn't have the thought because it's like asking me like, are you like, are you someone who believes in equality? Like, who would say no to that, right? Like, I thought the feminism question was like a weird fringe question. I did not know how urgent it was. Well, a girls' school and a women's college is meant to do that. I mean, right? right? It, is, it serves its function. I didn't go to a women's college. You went to a women's college. I went to a girls' yeshiva where we were not told. I mean, I just recently watched Mrs. America. Have you seen that? Yes, yes, yes. And I was like, what? All of this? Like, we were in history without this? I didn't know about any of that. I mean, I know it now. But I can't, I made my sons watch it with me. I, I was like, I don't know if this is gonna fall through the cracks for you too, but I didn't know about these people. I know, and yeah, and don't you, but don't you like, like I feel this incredible affinity, like for Bella Abzug, I mean like incredibly moved because talk about nerve to say what, you know, I was mentioning earlier, the notion of being, the, you know, saying something, being the first one to say something, saying it loud and knowing that you, that there will be people, those, you know, those women were mocked and, you know, it was, it was like good natured, horrible, mean ribbing and, and you know, not- And they all to live long enough so that you're the kind of conservative point of view on it. It's funny, when I finished that show, something, I don't know why, but I ordered a bunch of, of Bella Abzug um, campaign buttons. I, I don't know why I did it. I. Yeah, felt, I felt I wanted to have her in my life on That's my. Right. No, I think it's a great it's a great person to channel. Um, I wanted to ask you. This is going a little bit away from feminism. Um, uh, so, you know, the book is really really funny. I mean, feminism can be really funny. I didn't mean to suggest that it wasn't. Feminists rather. Humorous. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so I feel like sometimes we want, we, again, want our novelists to have a gravitas like Jam Kutsia, you know, on the page, but when they get up, we want them to be Shecky Green. What, I mean, there's a reference that the young will love. Um, <laughs> um, an old timey comedian. Uh, but what, so, I mean, of course we who like, funny books, love, 
funny books. Port Noise Complaint was really, really funny. So funny. Um, what is it? I mean, in what what is? Do you, do you ever think I'm being funny here, or does it just is it just organic to your nature when you're writing when you were writing this novel? I th thank you. I for the inferred that my book is fit. Um, I I just wrote it the way I talk, and I think that. Oh. That's, I, I think that's how I talk. I know that when I try to go back and make something funny, I can't do it. It's hard, it's like Mad Libs, insert joke here. It's so yeah, like, like when, when I get an edit note that's like, you could have more fun with this, I freak, I'm like, maybe we should just delete it. Like if this, yeah, we should just delete this probably right. because I don't know what that means. I don't even know what that means. Like, and the same is true, <laughs> right? The same is true. So you see your writing, all of a piece, essentially, whether you're writing a profile or an essay yeah. and your or your novel. It's and I like, didn't. Like, at first, I wanted my novel to be a fancy novel. Right, like, a, yeah. And it kept, I kept having to, I kept having to um, remind, no, not remind myself, that I kept having my editors, they were, they kept reminding me that you don't, you don't have to be a different kind of writer. Like your my, your journalism was never that journalisty anyway. Like, and that is that was hard for me to do because I kept thinking like, what does a novelist sound like? And so the book at first it's first person now, but it was third person. And what made you make that switch? Um, my friend Mark said to me after reading it, he said he said, do you think any man would hesitate to be his exact self in his writing just to sound fancier and i said i don't know i've never been a man maybe but he said it feels very um retrograde that you feel like after having a successful journalism career where people comment on your voice all the time that you would need to sound different instead of sounding even more like yourself like go for it and that is when the book i went through the book in the in the year before it was published and i made it first person um my hope was that you would read this book and you would know that one of the characters in it had a re like was was messing with it but at the end nobody nobody realized that it did not feel like it was changed that it underwent this thing oh, like good not feel that way at all good like, I, 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 so, so that so i think of it as all of a as a of a piece mm -hmm. and i think that the hardest thing about writing a magazine story or writing a novel or writing a screenplay is the amount in your head that, that you have of all the people who came before you and who defined being a writer for you, right? Like, who defined that for you? Who are you trying to live up to? Oh, the anxiety of influence thing, right? The Harold Bloom thing. Yeah, and, yeah. and also, I think that, by the way, one of the ways that we're lucky as women, and this is a very unscientific thing based on what I've heard, that when I was at GQ, I would hear about all these men who couldn't turn their work in. They were just, they were just tortured by it. And I kept thinking, what is it? And I guess I, I wonder if they have too many of what they think of as great men in their heads and how do they compete with that? Whereas the amount of women I was told were like gods of the structure were so much fewer that we were all allowed to do something different, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't have to, I didn't have all of these people to compete with. And I wasn't competing with the men because the men, again, like the men had a very different message than I had and they had a very different approach that I have. And I had, and I had no call for being cool. Like that was the thing. I had no call for anyone thinking that I was cool or sexy. Like there were, I was not trying to have, set with my work and i think a lot of those guys you work. weren't writing with your penis i wasn't because because i'm a touch because i'm like a touch typer <laughs> um 
let's talk a little bit about some of that nonfiction. Although what, before we do, actually, I should say, so you're writing, you studied screenwriting. I did, I did study screenwriting. And, uh, and you are now writing the show. The television Fleischman, television Fleischman, the Fleischman Variety Hour. Is it going to be called that? I it's, heard? it's definitely going to be called that. Amazing. And it's going to have the Benny Hill soundtrack. The Benny Hill soundtrack. Is it with Ernie Kovacs? And yeah, because um, the young will enjoy that one too. Um, uh, so you're doing that. So you you're this sort of master of these different forms. The celebrity profile. I'm a bit crazy about master of any form. Well, um, I, thank you. Well, you do it with with great. You know, authority. You, you, your novel has real authority, and these profiles do too. And they're funny and like a fascinating wormhole look into these people's lives. I actually wanted to uh, quote um, my friend, the writer Julie Clam, wrote a book called "The Stars in Our Eyes," and it's all about celebrity. It's a great and book. A wonderful book. I highly recommend it to everybody. And she has this. Uh, she has this anecdote in it. She wrote about an experiment done at Duke University Medical Center and 12 adult male rhesus macaque monkeys were given salty snacks that made them really thirsty. And then they were offered a choice, their favorite drink, which of course was cherry juicy juice, or the chance to look at their groups, uh, pictures of their group's dominant celebrity monkeys, the ones, photos of the monkeys that were the ones really magnetic and powerful. They chose the monkey. Presumably all the monkeys had big heads because that's the thing about celebrities, right? That they have big heads. Huge. They all chose the photos. They would rather sit there staring at photos of monkey, powered alpha monkeys, famous monkeys, than drink juicy juice. Um, is there something like that going on? Like why is it so fascinating to read about or even for you to interview Gwyneth Paltrow, like, is there something just generically about celebrity? So for me, I was never a big celebrity. I did not care a lot about celebrities, but celebrities were how you broke into, and especially a lot of women, how like we broke into writing for important magazines by doing what they assumed was the least important thing we, you could assign. I always loved it because I felt like celebrities are our true democracy. Like we, we keep them in business. We either love them or we don't go to their movies or we don't watch their, their shows. And the reason we elected them is because they rep every single celebrity represents something different to us in the culture. And Gwyneth Paltrow, your example, to me represented something that was so interesting, which was, the internet rise of hating a woman you were jealous of. That like the more, the better she did, the fewer flaws she had. Whereas 10 years before, that would make you go out and buy her exercise tape or whatever. Now it was a reason to hate her. And when, again, like the story instinct, when I saw the vitriol for her, I would think, Hey, that's not what was always. She was she was a great movie star that we loved. That's right, Shakespeare in Love, and yep. yeah, well, that's interesting. So the way in for you there is through the response in the culture, as opposed to necessarily yeah the person. person because mm -hmm. the response is all I can interact with. I don't think I could ever really get to know those people. Right, they know who I am. They see my tape recorder. So why try to get to know them or become or, or have something that simulates friendship when that will fail. It, it has to, they're actors. <laughs> right, that's right, that's right. Um, we need to move into questions. Oh, your questions are great, thank you. I wanna say before we do, I mean, it's just sort of like, I think that I, I was thinking about the great Janet Malcolm and her wonderful uh, interviews and profiles rather profiles and and nonfiction and and i feel that kind of nerve you know you attack attack very very different subjects but is she a writer that you admire is yes but i came to her late she, right. she was not formative to me yeah. she was just like a, like she, i had no idea who she was when i was starting again i went to film school and i was trying to do that that's what i was trying to do yeah. Right. And I think, by the way, that a lot of my nerve in writing came from the fact that I wasn't intimidated because I didn't know to be intimidated. Like I didn't, I hadn't read Joan Didion, so oh. I couldn't freak out about Joan Didion. That's really interesting. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. 
Well, um, anyway, the book is amazingly wonderful and nerve and wit. And I, I'm, I didn't read funny lines, but as I used to say at the end of all my book reports, you'll have to read it yourself to find <laughs> out. <laughs> That's what I do. This is the great fifth grade cop out book report. How did that do? Did you get good grades? No, yeah, pretty good. It, it, they caught on to me after a while. <laughs> but also in all my short fiction in that same year, it all ended with Ellen woke up. It was all a dream. <laughs> moved on a little bit. <laughs> that was going to be the end of the wife, but I just oh, that would have been an amazing. Ending. Okay, so um, let me see uh, some questions. Okay, um, am I supposed to say the person's name? You can. Okay, from Nathan Rothstein. I was really struck by the lines in the book about stay-at-home moms and what people think of them. I guess we are all now stay at home. How do you think Fleischman would have handled co-parenting during the pandemic? I mean, I think that he and his wife were divorced. Like they they would have had the same tense interactions over wondering which of them is dating. Um, I just heard from a friend today the most interesting thing, which is that the apps have taken on this weird thing where people just want to cohabitate. Like that you would meet someone online and be like, do you want to live together during this? And we, I could have just like a constant sex partner. Like, and I'm, I heard about this four hours ago and I'm still thinking about it. Um, I have so many follow-up questions about it, but I don't think he, I think that he would have handled co-parenting the same as he handles co-parenting without the pandemic, resentfully and um, territorially. But I'll also say, here's a weird plug. I published a short story today on The Cut called Fleischman is in Lockdown. I think uh, Fleischman is in a bubble, if you wanted to. Oh, is in a bubble, maybe that'll be the next one. And it's about a day in the life in his life at a hospital, at his hospital. He's really? no longer at the hospital because he's a hepatologist. He's now at a plastic surgery center um, that is do that is that is now a makeshift liver hospital. And it's filled with all the plastic surgery um, nurses who say things like, we're gonna freshen your liver right up. <laughs> Was this their idea that you do this or your idea? So they were so one of the editors tweeted at me. Um, what would Fleischman make of all of this during the height of things? Right. People were joking around with a title, Fleischman is in quarantine, Fleischman is in lockdown. And I mean, I said, I'll do it. And it was just a short, I've never written a short story before. You're doing your own fan fiction. I read, someone said that and I was like, oh no, did I do that? <laughs> yeah, it's 5,000 words and he has two sexual encounters in them, so. That's amazing. All right, it's out today. We will look at it. Um, Thank you, Nathan. So, first person narration and the uh, equals the cele and the celebrity journalist in you. How hard was it to give yourself permission to write a novel to take up that sort of space for yourself? I guess with yourself as Libby. Libby. Yeah. Since it's not really me, everyone. <laughs> My husband feels you should know that too. Um, um, it was hard. It was, I'm trying to think back. It was, I, she was the least developed character in the first draft. And my editor kept saying, um, my editor kept saying, she's allowed to, it's not like journalism. She's allowed to take up space. She's allowed to be a character. And I, and the way I grappled with that was by slowly, talking about how uncomfortable she was taking up space. So she's telling Toby's story so that she could eventually tell Rachel's story so that she could eventually tell her own story. Like she, she still, she, her triumph in the end is that she told the story, right? Isn't it always about that really? Who, who gets control of the narrative? It really is. It's like, it's funny, it's a theme. We were just watching Hamilton this weekend, like everyone else. And it's a theme of Hamilton, of like, who are the people who tell your story? And now, especially after the protests, I'm thinking a lot about all the history I know, though luckily I was in yeshiva and didn't know much of it. But the reason that's lucky is because, I, you know, I didn't have, a, a history of this country to me that was narrated by 
by the the people who won, right? Like that to me, the textbooks I've read, the fact that I was told that Christopher Columbus discovered this country, like it's all the same. Whoever gets to tell the story, and I see it at the New York Times, whoever gets to tell the story has the power over history. And even in a novel, that's meaningful, I think. Don't you? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that it's been really interesting about the women sort of very slyly, I don't want to say quite rising up in your book, but I, and I don't want to give too much away, but there's um, a very sinuous sort of shift that is really beautifully done. Okay. And it was really about women telling the story and the story right. of women that often may go ignored. Um, what has been the most challenging part of adapting your own book for television? Um, the amount of lines that I assume are amazing and clever and don't fit. Um, when I started episode one, um, by the way, they're not. I'm, I hope you catch my facetiousness. Like things that I think are absolutely necessary, that's the hardest part of understanding that people will understand. And when you're used to being able to use as many words as you want, you don't ever have to worry about that. But this is all about showing, and it's a real, it's a real trick of the mind to wonder how you can truly show something without words that would, and leave it in the hands of other people. There's a director, there are actors before, before you feel like on the page you have conveyed exactly what should happen in the most airtight way that is not subject to interpretation, which of course it still is. That's what's hardest. Do you think actually that your your film studies changed your fiction? Did it did it like did you kind of did some part of you want to cut to the chase or express everything through dialogue in a way that you might not have done? I mean I know there are certain writers like Richard Price who's, uh, you know, a terrific novelist and also a uh, screenwriter. And, you know, you just sort of wonder what the effect of one on the other is. He started off, I think, as a novelist and, and turned to film. He did, novel. I think. Um, I think that it is that the screenwriting has informed both journalism and, and, um, and novel writing in that, it, in that screenwriting does, when you're taught it, it does not, there's no room for nebulousness. There's no room for a kind of ending that doesn't make sense. You have a beginning and a middle and an end, and it all has to be of one piece and it all has to be super efficient. So no matter how many words you use, it still has to be massively efficient. It still has to make sense and it still has to have certain payoffs which you can execute in the structure of any story that you're telling. You do it quite naturally when you tell an anecdote at a cocktail party. And I think when you get to something that's journalism and feels important to convey the information, you forget about basic storytelling rules that are time honored and that people love. And when you get to novel writing, the scary thing about novel writing is how much freedom you have in it and how there is no prescription for it. Well, there was that line by uh, Somerset Mom. I, I can't remember the number. There are like seven rules for writing a novel. Unfortunately, nobody knows what they are. It's true, like any novel can be anything and that's the joy right. of the form and it's also terrifying. But there is something more than that though because you know how to write a novel and it, it, which I think is connected to the reading experiences of the past. Oh. You don't usually read a screenplay, you see a movie, so you're not, most people don't. I read screenplays all the time. You, know, you do, you do, but most people go to the movies, aren't freaks. Like, <laughs> yeah, most, no, most people don't read screenplays, I don't think, um, some do, but we just see it play out. Right? I'm obsessed with storytelling. I'm obsessed with looking at a, listening to a song and understanding why it affected me. Like those are the things, those are the subjects of my obsession. I've read relatively mm -hmm. little because I, I think because I love to reread something and find out like where was the minute where this thing exploded for me? Where is the minute that like, what led, what were the ingredients that led me to cry at this thing? So you can feel it in a concentrate in a song, right? Yeah. Right. 
Like, or a movie trailer. Those are great. You have so many feelings when you watch a movie trailer. And it's really interesting to try to dissect why you have those feelings at, at that particular time. And they bring in the music and like. Well, they, know, they find all the good stuff, right? It's like, they're like the equivalent of an appetizer on a menu. And then everything is downhill. I know. I know. Stuffed potatoes. I love those. But you had, you had an inherent sense of how to write a novel. It's not just that you said, I can do anything. Um, Maybe. I mean, it was like a shot in the dark. I didn't expect anyone to want to buy it or read it. But you know, I, I've always thought that every novel, when it begins, is like a grandiose fantasy, and you write, you write a draft of it, and then you then you have to reckon with not the thing that you wanted to do, but the thing that you did do, and, and that's so true. And there's a little bit of grief because you realize it isn't about, you know, this is not about farmland in the 19th century. It's about a girl named Debbie in Exit 43. You know, it, it's. I don't know where I went wrong, but um, um, but you, th there's a little grief when you realize that yeah. you have to do everything, but it's also humbling, or at least it gets it into something real rather than the grandiose fantasy, which isn't a novel, right? It's a fantasy inside. Right, but potential is a really beautiful thing. A blank page is beautiful, but it is not as beautiful as the phrase, the end because then at least you can work with something. But I think you can still like insert the themes you wanted to. You could make you can it- go back and like insert themes when you yeah. realize, yes, right? This is a sort of trick. It's yeah. sort of like Jerry Seinfeld's wife inserting the vegetables into the- It's like her. Jessica Seinfeld, just yeah. like her. Exactly. It, it, it's, it's, it's true that if you tell a story, if you get it down as fast as you can, I think, then you could spend a lot of time building it out and making it work. Don't you think so? You've yeah. done it so many times more than I do. Like, how, yeah. how does it work for you? Oh, well, I guess I feel like I think I know what I want to write about, and then I write it, and then I see, in fact, what I'm spending more time on. That must be where the heat is. It's sort of like the opposite mm -hmm. of, say, you know, don't get in an elevator in a fire, you know, because it'll go to the floor with the heat. You want to go to the yeah. floor with the heat. And right. you sometimes don't really know where that is until you've written a draft. And then once you know what excites you. Right, right, you right, right. And, and sort of linger in those places. True, true. Oh, more. Um, something going on here? No, the dog, the oh. dog. I heard the dog. I was wondering if he was still here. <laughs> she doesn't have a dog. Um, <laughs> uh, I think someone dropped off the dog. <laughs> um, so you're writing, you just finished a new novel. I finished my second novel. I handed it in a week ago, a week and a half ago, maybe La a week ago Thursday. And I don't know yet. I'll, see, I'll let you know. But it's going to be a ton of editing. Do you want to say anything about it? It's thank you. It is a. It is a. It is. It takes place on Long Island. It is called Long Island Compromise, and it is about a Jewish family on Long Island that um, that is that that deals with the inherited trauma that they all have, including their inherited money. Um, my, my editor called it Jewish succession, except in Jewish succession, nobody wants the family business. <laughs> They're just like, please, I don't wanna run this thing. <laughs> no, thank you. I would like to go off and be a poet. <laughs> Have a, a, was it a weird experience moving on from the characters from your first book? Did you feel a sort it of was horrible? It was horrible because I did it so quickly after this one. I was still promoting it, this book, while I was writing this book. Right. And that is so weird. It's the characters weren't the problem. It was the when you when people like your book, you don't know exactly why they liked it, but you want to replicate that. And well, we don't know how to. I think one thing I, I always think about with fiction is that to me, a great novel is such a deep pleasure. Right. I think the word pleasure really comes into play. Do you feel that way? And, and oh my God, I think it's only about pleasure. I think it's not about instruction or morality. I think it is only about pleasure and then maybe something deeper sneaking up on you, but the pleasure of, the, of a well-told story is first. There was some study, uh, it wasn't about, it was about 
think it had to do with religion or something. They showed a group of like preschool children, some amoebas under a microscope, and they asked them to comment on what they saw. And the children said, oh, that one's the funny one. That one's the mommy. That one's the daddy. These one-celled organisms. I think, are we hardwired for narrative? Maybe. What do you think? I think we're, I think we just want to make a story out of things. I think it's too boring to just not, we have a life that's a, that has a beginning and an end and we don't know when it ends. That's like the big mystery of our lives. A friend of mine said that everybody, every human is like a different animal. Like, you know how some live a really long time, like elephants and some have like a, you That's know. so true, right? We don't know what animal we are. Right, we don't know which, I mean, am I a dog where? A hummingbird. Later, like, I don't know. Um, but I think of that, That's I think that's very true. And we don't know where it ends. And it is very gratifying in our souls to, it gives us a sense of control to see a beginning and a middle and an end play out. Do you think, um, I, we, we need to stop in a moment, but I will close out a little bit with this. I mean, so we're in this really crazy, upsetting, hard time right now, painful. What do you mean? <laughs> oh, okay, go on. <laughs> um, uh, there's that we again. Um, what, I mean, you kind of think like, what's the role? Can can fiction soothe people? Um, I worry about attention span. I worry about all the good television. I th but I think it's 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 the writer's job to grapple with this. I've been see you know what was what's been very disturbing to me is seeing this kind of um, sentiment, especially on Twitter, people saying like, oh, there's a lot of shitty art that's going to come out of this. Like, why do people think that? I think the things that are gonna come out of this are going to be extraordinary. I think that that everybody who wants to will create something beautiful from it. And it, each of it will be a droplet in our, what will be our lifelong attempt to make sense of this moment and how it's changed us. What, what do you think? Well, I think that you're speaking to the idea that fiction, um, helps us not while not attempting to necessarily it's a snapshot of a moment in time quite often or many moments in time yeah. so it can have resonance later when that moment is no longer there right or even if the moment is still there and you feel like you're inside yourself there is a connection there's always an implicit dialogue i think between the reader and the writer and you actually make that very explicit in your novel there are really you feel like we're in, you are in conversation with Yeah, I, I, and I feel like it's a weakness. It's funny, I feel like it's a weakness in my writing that I always feel that I am telling the reader a story instead of just letting a story play out. Well, but, but I reader, like, I, reader, reader, I married him. Urgent. Reader, I married him. I mean, you come from a great tradition. So whatever you do, yeah, I married him. Keep doing it. Um, are, did you have anything you, I know, I hate when people ask me oh, this. Oh, no, I don't have anything. <laughs> you have I'm nothing. I, sh <laughs> I that question. You have to say I'm, that I'm your process. I didn't ask you that one either. So you're, you got off easy tonight. You have more questions, but I'm going to got off easy tonight. That's all um, I have to think. What I do want to say is I want to thank The Strand, and I want to thank everybody who came here and for supporting um, The Strand. And I want to thank you for taking time out of your writing to to do this with me this has meant the world to me i have i was your fan for so many years before we were friends and i i can't believe in the fan fiction version of myself um i got to i got to sit with you and do this wow. it was a great pleasure. pleasure i love the strand i love this book i hope everybody reads it if they haven't already and um support all bookstores support taffy's book and all the books you love Thank and you. thank That's you great. all for coming tonight and congratulations on this wonderful book. Thank you, Meg. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.